Good afternoon. On behalf of Paraclete Press and Iron Pen, we welcome you to this reading and conversation today of Holy Land with Angela Alimo O'Donnell. My name is Rachel McKendry. I'm the publicist here at Paraclete. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our recording of today's reading and discussion will be available later on to share with anyone who couldn't join us. And we'll also let you know how to get your own copies of Holy Land and our entire poetry collection here at Paraclete. Please take a moment to find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can also locate the chat bar there if you would. And please uh, feel free to submit any questions you might have for Angela. And hopefully we'll get to those during our time together today. By way of introduction, Angela Alimo O'Donnell is a writer, poet, and professor. She teaches English, creative writing, and courses in Catholic studies at Fordham University in New York City, and serves as associate director of Fordham's Curran Center for American Catholic Studies. She's also co-editor of the Curran Center's new book series, Studies in the Catholic Imagination, the Flannery O'Connor Trust series, published by Fordham University Press. Angela was one of our first place winners in the 2021 Paraclete Poetry Competition. She shared this with um, Amy Nemechek, who I see is also here with us today. And um, we're so, so fortunate to be able to add both of these beautiful books to our poetry library here at Paraclete. So thank you again to the two of you. I just wanna share a few of the um, beautiful words that people have said about Holy Land. Another of our poets, Scott Cairns said, these poems, midrashic, speculative, and fearless in pursuit of wisdom, manifest yet again the linguistic elegance and profound faith that I have come to expect from the poetry of Angela Alimo O'Donnell. Whether poring over a text, a landscape, or the faces of human persons, she is a poet who attends to and honors the inexhaustible mystery inhabiting every appearance. And another friend who's with us today, Paul Mariani, also said about this collection, each place here, from her pilgrimage to the holy places in Galilee and Jerusalem, and then on to Ireland, indeed reveals itself as one more holy place filled with the music of her splendid poetry. There is so much beauty here in all the places O'Donnell lifts up in song, revealing to us again and again and again in the most unexpected and seemingly quotidian spaces, the beauty of it all and all with the eyes and heart of Christ, who indeed does play in 10,000 places and more. There are more words I could share, but I don't wanna take away any more of Angela's time. So again, Angela, thank you so much for trusting this collection to Paraclete. Congratulations on another beautiful collection. And thank you so much for reading today. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that beautiful introduction. Um, and thank you to Paraclete, which is such a, a, a wonderful publisher to work with. Um, the books that Paraclete produces in terms of their content are stunning. And the books themselves are, as you can see, <laughs> beautiful artifacts. Um, so it's really a privilege and an honor for an author like myself to, to work with Paraclete and to work with you. So thank you. Um, and, and thank you for hosting today's reading. I'm so thrilled to be able to um, be able to engage in conversation with the folks who are with us today. And I understand it's being broadcast on Facebook too. So some more people may join us as well, uh, which is delightful. It, it's, you know, writers don't write for themselves. We write for other people. Uh, and, uh, and it's just a joy to have readers and a joy to have listeners uh, because poetry is first and foremost an oral, oral art. Uh, it's meant to be heard like music rather than to be read on a page. Um, that having been said, though, I do hope you'll read it on the page <laughs> as well as uh, as well as listen uh, today. Um, so yes, um, I'm I'm very excited about this collection, um, and I'll just say a few words about it before I read any of the poems. Uh, as you'll note from the title, it's called Holy Land, not the Holy Land, um, because uh, even though the, the poems started in the Holy Land, um, they uh, the, the the intention of the book is to go beyond just one geographical space. Um, there are actually two epigraphs to the book, which might help 
then it, it could be more understandable. Um, the, the first epigraph comes from Exodus and it says, remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And of course, we'll all recognize that as being the words that Moses hears when God speaks to him through the burning bush uh, and, and designates the space on which they're standing to be holy ground and worthy of reverence. Um, so that's the first epigraph. The second one comes from Chief Black Elk, uh, who you also may know, whose work you may know, whose writings you may know, and also know that he converted a Native American chief who then converted to Christianity, Christianity to Catholicism. Uh, and he says, the Holy Land is everywhere. Um, so these two epigraphs sort of work with each other and in tension against one another. Uh, and I particularly love the Black Elk quotation because it made me think about and ponder the idea that there are lots of holy places all over the world. Every place, in some sense, has been sanctified by human presence, by human um, uh, experience uh, in the world. It has been loved by human beings. That space has been occupied and tilled. Um, and there's really no places that aren't sacred and holy in some way. So the book talks about and celebrates some of those geographical places, but then it also um, extends outward and, and uh, celebrates less not geographical places, intellectual spaces, spiritual spaces, experiential spaces um, of what it is to be human. Uh, and takes us basically on a journey through these holy lands and through these other spaces that we occupy as human beings. Um, so I hope that that helps to um, give us a sense of what the book is intended to do. Um, I'll start by reading um, some of the poems that are set in the holy lands. Uh, I was very blessed to go on a pilgrimage in 2019, right before the you know, COVID shut everything down, uh, with a group of people, there were 12 of us, um, and uh, it was really an incredible experience going to all of these sites in the Holy Land that I had heard about all of my life, I had read about all of my life, uh, and then all of a sudden to be there in those spaces made those stories come alive for me. Um, and made the, the characters and the figures in those stories come alive to me in a way that they had never been before. And chief of those, a chief among those figures, of course, is the figure of Christ, um, his omnipresence in the Holy Land, um, all of the sites of, of pilgrimage that we went to. Uh, I had this uncanny sense of presence um, that I wanted to probe and celebrate somehow in poems. Um, and so there's a series of poems in the beginning of the book that are called Christ Sightings. Uh, and I'd like to read a couple of these. Uh, the first one is, um, is called The Storm Chaser. And uh, most of these poems, by the way, are sonnets uh, because I think the sonnet is the ideal form for pilgrimage. Uh, it, um, it has 14 lines, that just as the Stations of the Cross have 14 stations. Uh, and each line of the sonnet is like a step in the pilgrimage on the journey that one is making. Uh, and each of the poems themselves are like stations. So that's kind of how I think of the way that the sonnet works um, in, uh, in the book. Um, the Storm Chaser originated, uh, I, I go running every morning, no matter where I am. And so I'm always running in different environments and by different rivers. Uh, but this is the first time I ever woke up in, and found myself right, running by the Sea of Galilee. Um, and so this poem is called The Storm Chaser. It's set at the Mount of the Beatitudes, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, October 16th, 2019, 7 a.m. I'm sorry, I am going to share my screen right now before I begin reading because um, I also have some images that are going to accompany these poems. So let me do that before I uh, start reading. Here we go. There we go. Okay, this is called The Storm Chaser. Running along the Sea of Galilee, I see you in your boat, tall brown man that you are, standing in the prow, arms raised in supplication to the skies, wind whipped tunic blowing wild and high as the waves that have paralyzed your friends, who have hit the deck and now lie prone on the sodden wood, dumb as stone and waiting for what surely is the end. So low in the boat, I can't even see them. You alone are all might, pure motion in the shape of a God. 
this small ocean no match for your infinite love, for them, for the sky, for the sea, and yes, even for me. And the image you're looking at is my best I could do with my cell phone of uh, the sunrise uh, on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the next poem that I'd like to read is um, also set in the Holy Land. Uh, and it is in a very beautiful church called uh, the, the, um, the, the Women's Chapel, uh, Encounter Chapel in the town of Magdala, where Mary Magdalene uh, supposedly came from. Uh, and this church is de devoted to all holy women. It sits right on the Sea of Galilee. And all throughout the church, there are these beautiful murals uh, depicting Jesus in in uh, conversation and uh, with women uh, and all of the stories that one remembers um, from uh, from the Bible are, are not all of them but many of them are depicted here but the one that I found the most powerful is this mural right here which is down in the uh, basement of the church uh, behind one of the chapels um, or in one of the chapels and uh, as you can see um, this is the whole mural and it's huge. Um, and it is the moment uh, in the story in that is told in Mark in which the woman who has been suffering from a hemorrhage all of these years touches Jesus' garment uh, and is healed of her hemorrhage um, in a way that no doctor could possibly help her, no one could help her. Um, so this kind of electrifying moment here where she touches Christ's robe um, was just so powerful to me. And so I wrote this poem and it's called The Thief. Uh, and the epigraph to the poem says, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? When she touched him, she stole his fire, woman Prometheus who wouldn't take no for an answer. She was bold and full of blood, despised creature who crept along the edges of the swollen crowd. When she spied gold, bore her broken body to the sun center of the Lord's pulsing love. Call it a miracle it took two to make. Call it a reverse Midas moment, but tell it true and tell it blunt. Her sudden bout of faith, her long torment, her taking what her old God would not give. Long after his dying, she would live. Um, the next poem that I'd like to read is, again, a very famous moment in the life of Christ um, when the woman is taken uh, in adultery, uh, supposedly, and all of the men of the village bring her to Christ. Um, and, of course, they want to trick him uh, because they want to see what he's going to do, uh, because this woman, of course, according to the law, is supposed to be stoned for her sin. Uh, and one of the most interesting parts of the story is as they're all standing there waiting for uh, Christ, uh, he bends down, and this lovely depiction here um, uh, of, of this moment, he bends down and he starts writing in the dirt. Uh, and the, the story, um, as it's told in John, does not tell us what Christ is writing. Um, so we don't know, it's really a mystery. Uh, and that's one of the most interesting things about the story. Uh, why does he do the writing, first of all, and what is it that he's writing in the dust? Uh, and so this poem that, you know, I was reminded of this scene when we were standing on the Mount of Olives, this poem tries to account for some of that mystery. Uh, so this is called the Mount of Olives and the epigraph comes from John and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. I know this much, she didn't speak. Women are never believed when they do. She stood up to be judged didn't seek mercy from those men. She knew they'd kill her, do what they wanted to do or not, depending on one man they wanted to snare in their net webbed and woven of half true lies. Deciding who lives and who dies, blood sport to them, but not him. He bent down and wrote in the sand their names and beside them each one's sins, each daily failing each man's debt. One by one, the sinners left. 
Um, the next poem I'd like to read from this group of Christ sightings is a slightly more personal one uh, about my own encounter uh, with um, the sense of the presence of Christ uh, when we went to the River Jordan. Uh, and as you'll see, this is a photograph of myself and my husband who is on the, um, on the uh, pilgrimage with me. Um, and uh, it's, uh, we had the oddest experience when we first stepped into the river um, because all of these little fish came out <laughs> and were surrounding us. Um, and we thought it was kind of funny at first, uh, but then of course it made me think uh, about whether or not this is something that, and of course fish, the word ichthys is associated with Jesus. Um, the early Christians, because they had to practice their Christianity in secret, used to let other Christians know where their meetings were going to have to happen by drawing a fish. Uh, and so it seemed very interesting to me that going to the River Jordan, the first thing that we experience is fish. Um, so this is called Ichthys at the Jordan, and it's set on the West Bank in Palestine. We waded into those easy waters like children in search of a blessing. Tiny fish flashed and gathered, nipped our feet, a strange welcoming. It was as if they'd been waiting for us, knew we had been following from sea to sea to sea, the Fisher King. While we waited, we wondered if they greeted you too, as John poured the Jordan on your bare head. The moment you were sure who you were, was the sky this blue, the sun this warm, the water this sweet, fish gathering and flashing at your feet. Another place that we visited, which was very powerful, was Bethany, uh, where Jesus, or rather, where Lazarus lived and died, and where he was buried. Uh, and we went um, to get to Lazarus's tomb. You have to go pretty far underground. Um, and when we got down there, it was a very, very tiny space. If you have any claustrophobia whatsoever, beware of going into Lazarus's tomb. Um, but it was very striking to us uh, and, and that, that, you know, the story, which is a huge story, of course, in Christian tradition, took place in such a tiny little space. Uh, and so this poem is about that experience of being in that small space called Lazarus, and it's set in Bethany, Palestine. Deep beneath the street, we found you. The passage narrow, the stairway steep, a space barely big enough to stand in, let alone lie. The rock walls thick, the ceiling low. We ducked and still hit our heads. Tiny Lazarus. Your story bigger than you and us. Four feet tall, 10 feet underground. I could not help but wonder how you heard your name. The women weep. Life come knocking at death's cold door. You fast trapped and fast asleep. Christ's call so loud, such a surprise. What could you do but wake and rise? Um, I actually kind of love this figure of Lazarus, and I have written about him before. And I'm going to I'm going to go off off um, uh, off plan for a moment and read another poem uh, that I wrote about Lazarus a number of years ago, just because there are a number of different ways in which to see him uh, as a as a figure. Uh, this poem is from a previous book of mine that some of you may know, Saint Sinatra, uh, which engages real saints, uh, and then also people that we think might be, should be saints, including Sinatra. Uh, and at the time I wrote this poem, I did not know Lazarus was a saint. He is as evidently an Eastern tradition, but a, a, and not in the Western one. Um, so this is a poem that is really asking, calling for Lazarus's sainthood. Um, and it's an 18 line sonnet. It's called Saint Lazarus. And um, it's, you know, Lazarus, he should be a saint, right? I mean, he he, go, he dies, he comes back to life, he dies again, and he's a very good sport about all of this. So it seems to me that that's about as saintly as you can get. Um, so this is called Saint Lazarus, and it again tries to imagine what it might have been like to be Lazarus waking up in the tomb. He knit himself up a cable stitch of skin, pushed his left eye in his socket, and then his right, cracked the knuckles in his fingers, now so thin, raised himself from the dirt 
and stood upright. Lazarus, Lazarus, don't get busy. Lazarus, Lazarus, now get busy. Mary's weeping, Martha's made a cake. Jesus is calling at the graveyard gate. Your closest cousin, happy you are dead. Eyes, Mary, Martha's sheep and Mary's empty bed. The chorus of voices sings him awake. Once a body's broken, it cannot break. He licks his lips and wags his muscled tongue, flexes each foot till the warm blood comes, turns from the darkness and moves toward the sun, a step, a shamble, a dead out run. Um, another stop on the journey um, through the Holy Land uh, is um, going, walking along the Via Dolorosa, uh, the, the path that Christ took uh, supposedly on his way to Calvary. Um, this was not at all what I expected. <laughs> uh, when I would imagine walking that pathway, I would imagine a rural road. Um, I would imagine you know, dirt and a few scrub bush bushes and rocks. Uh, and then, you know, getting to the hill that is Golgotha. Uh, it was not like that at all. And those of you who have been to the Holy Land know that. Um, the streets of Jerusalem are teeming with people. There are shops all around. There are people trying to sell you rugs and pottery and food and, you know, you know scarves, all sorts of things. Uh, so it's, it has a, a sort of a carnival atmosphere. Um, so there was really nothing about the, the, this journey that struck me as being solemn. Um, but then it also struck me that during Jesus' time, there probably were also people trying to sell people stuff because after all, executions were a form of entertainment for people during the time. Um, so maybe it isn't far, so far flung from the actual time uh, and experience um, that people would have had being present uh, during the time. Uh, but one particular stop along the stations, the 14 stations was very striking to me. It's station number five at the chapel of St. Simon of Cyrene. And I will show a picture of this. In the wall, and this is the wall of Jerusalem, there is this big um, indentation. And uh, tradition has it that Christ put his hand there when he, one of the times when he fell with his cross. Uh, and it has been identified as such for centuries. And so millions and millions of pilgrims have put their hand in that space, just as this woman is in this picture, putting her hand in the space in the wall. And so it has become indented. Um, and as I put my hand in the space in the wall, I had this, again, kind of electrifying sensation of connection, um, not only with the original hand, the hand of Christ, but all of the other hands that have since touched that space. Um, so this poem has um, an epigraph, as you can see, and I actually made it up. <laughs> it says, Station 5, the Chapel of St. Simon of Cyrene. To the right of the lintel, in the corner of a wall of the wall at shoulder height, is a smooth stone with a hollow, where Jesus supposedly placed his hand when he stumbled while carrying the cross. And this comes from a book that I invented called The Skeptic's Guide to the Holy Land. Put your hand in my side, Christ said to Thomas. I put my hand in the hole in the wall. It was just the size of a suffering man's. It was just the size of my sin. I faltered too. I did not trust the stone or flesh. Both men are dead. But in this place, I felt our hands touch. The space was just the span of my five fingers. Nothing can convince me now he was not here, that Magdalene's unruly hair was not soothed by that healing hand, that he was not more than a man. And the last one that I'll read of this group is set in Bethlehem. Um, and going, to, going to the place where Christ um, supposedly was born, it's a very powerful experience, as you might imagine. Uh, and particularly when we think about this in the context of the current world and circumstances in which we live, uh, where you know disasters befit us, befall us constantly, wars are raging, um, pandemic is still raging, it's not over, of course, um, and there are more disasters on the horizon. 
Uh, and into the midst of all of this disaster comes this birth. The poem is called Christ Sighting, Church of the Nativity, Bethlehem, Palestine, December 25th. Here comes the dark, the dearth of the year, and here comes Christ again, born where he's least expected and most needed. Now and here, in the midst of famine, comes this feast, fit for fools, surrounded by the ruin we have made of our own earth the rivers black with mourning for the jewels they once were, the air thick with smoke from the charred trees. Now in the darkness, we fall to our knees in wonder at the baby birthed just for us. We deserve nothing, no small sign of luck in a world ripped by sickness, choked with anger. Love lies sleeping in a dirty manger. Uh, I also wanted to write about other holy places. Uh, and one of those holy places is, uh, to me, um, Ireland. Um, most of you know that despite my last name, O'Donnell, uh, I have no Irish blood in me whatsoever. I have the blood of Sicilian peasants rather than Irish kings in my veins. Um, however, I have a deep, uh, a deep appreciation and affection for Ireland. And maybe it's because, you know, Sicil Sicily is a rocky island, Ireland is a rocky island, we have that in common. Um, both are places of, of, you know, exile, far away from the centers of action, um, very beautiful places, storied places, mythic places, um, with a, a deep pagan background as well as a deep Christian background. Um, so Ireland and, and, uh, and Sicily, I think, have a lot in common. Uh, and of course, I love the Irish writers, and that's one of the reasons that I, they use the English language in an incomparable way. So that's another reason why I'm so, um, I, I love Ireland, because it, it nurtured and brought these poets, uh, wonderful poets, into being. Um, so I wrote a suite of poems that are basically about not belonging in Ireland, <laughs> even though I feel like I belong there. Um, and it's called Crossing Ireland, the suite of poems. So I'm going to read a few from these um, from this group. Uh, the first one I'm going to read is called On Not Belonging in Ireland. Our air, in, our air lingus flies through Irish skies, and I know I'm not at home well before my feet touch the tarmac. Filing into Shannon, we take our places in the long line of Irish expats whose cousins left as hopeful as they arrive. Here, I am clear, extra, exotic by Irish measure, if not New York's, my dark hair and olive hands a sign. You don't look Catholic, says the ex-priest who left Queens and his cassock behind for this spot at Hughes Bar and Spittle. Italian or Jew, what's the difference, says the glint in his Irish eye. Nothing of you begins here where we do. His American accent, stronger than mine, me with my traitor's poet's ear who loves all music better than my own. At two weeks end, I'll speak with a lilt, the song of the island sown in my dreams, my foreign heart more native than she seems. Um, we also visited uh, the beautiful, beautiful west of Ireland, uh, County Kerry. Um, County Kerry is, uh, first of all, it's, it's, you know, magical, as you can tell from this lovely, <laughs> lovely depiction of uh, the hills and the, and the, uh, the lakes uh, and the greenery. And, the, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the west of Ireland is where magical Ireland supposedly is. People there still believe in fairies. Um, they, they tell folkloric stories about the supernatural events that happen all the time in the landscape. Uh, but another reason that the West of Ireland is particularly famous is because of the horror of the famine that took place in Ireland um, in 1846, 1847, 1848. 1847 is known as Black 47. Over a million people died of starvation in Ireland. Um, so when you're in County Kerry, that you really feel as though you're in a, a haunted landscape um, because so many of the people who die in, die in Ireland were poor people who lived in the West. Um, so this poem um, called County Kerry um, is a, a poem that honors that sad tradition of the lost. 
County Kerry in the shadow of McGillicuddy Reeks is the location. Unreal, the way we walk among them, full of our bangers and eggs, clad in our, our smart Macintoshes and good boots, safe from the rain that pierces them like bullets from a dark god. There is death out here in the beauty, a hunger remembered in the earth. The mountain rises slant like mercy. The slow slope of light eases the grace under all that suffering and sorrow beyond the dark ringed eyes of the haunted whose hunger can know no end. We call it drama, romance, history. We trespass on their mystery. Um, another charming aspect of Ireland uh, for us in terms of my experience there, I've traveled there several times. Um, the Irish are very welcoming and very hospitable, especially if you have an Irish last name. Um, but they're also very quick to remind you that being Irish American doesn't make you Irish. Um, you're kind of welcome here, but you're also kind of not. Uh, they acknowledge you as being an outsider and someone who really doesn't belong. Um, even if you're Irish American, uh, they are refer to us as Yanks, um, or I should say Irish Americans as Yanks. So um, we, we had the wonderful experience of staying at this little pub you can see is called Team Molly, which means Molly's house. Uh, it actually belongs to the, the pub belongs to the family of a friend of ours and a colleague of ours. And so she said, oh, well, you must meet my family and you must be able to stay at the pub. And we did. We stayed at the uh, apartment above the pub. And then in the evenings, we would come down and we would meet all of the people who would come to the pub. Um, but our first there, day there, we met our friend's cousin, um, Padraig. Um, and this is, um, uh, this is our encounter with him as described in this poem. You're making the Yanks tour, are you? Pather said, he and smiling behind the bar, pouring four pints for his new American friends. A 100 mile drive from Kerry to here, amusing to a man for whom the next county is another country away. He told us the history of the pub, the clock that stopped at Molly's daughter's birth, a century gone, ticked past the time. While we, he walked us from stone room to stone room, naming the faces in the stations on the walls, a Celtic Virgil leading a misguided tour. All the while we drank the famous Guinness drawn from Molly's lines laid long ago, making it the best on the spittle road. While we argued poetry, Barack Obama, the slant of the light on Connemara cliffs, no new thing fine as the old. What he knew, he knew sure as his own hand and wouldn't take no for an answer. Keeney was a hack, Donegal man dishonest, and Clifton as far as he'll need to go, should you need to leave home for a while, and you know you'll be needing to come back. Um, we also had the experience of going to um, the islands off of the coast of Galway. Um, there are three islands there, and the one that tourists most often go to is called Inishmore. It's the biggest of the three islands. You have to take a ferry across. Uh, and the first time that we went there, there was really very little traffic on the island, very few vehicles. So what you basically did was you rented a bike and you, you rode all over the island, which was great fun, but also rather treacherous because, you know, in Ireland, it just rains <laughs> All of a sudden, it's sunny, and then it just rains all over you, and you get soaked, and then it dries off, and you, and you dry off. Um, but the second time we went there, uh, when we got off of the ferry, uh, there were all of these minivans um, waiting to take the tourists around the island. And most of them were very smart, nice looking, you know, Mercedes minivans, and, and you would rent the van along with other people, and they would take you all over. But there was this one fellow. <laughs> who had an old beat up uh, red van. And he came up to me and he said, I, you know, I, his name was Tomas, I'll take you, I'll take you. And I'm a sucker, you know, I, he was the first person to ask me and I said, fine. So we got into his van and very shortly thereafter, we discovered it was a mistake. Um, so this little poem is um, a little tribute to Tomas, our driver on Innismore. Um, and it's called Innismore Tour. Tomas, the crazy man of Aaron, waved his worn map at me, his red minibus idling patiently. I'll take you on a tour in your very own van, 
the eight euro fee he promised a steal. We were charmed, fooled, dumbed into the deal. Great stout fellows, he bellowed at the seals who wallowed on the island's western shore as if they'd heard and answered him before. He told the same three jokes. Seven thousand stone walls on the island, though I don't know who counted them, he'd intone. Then laughed the mirthless laugh of the mad, while we all stared straight ahead, hoping he'd keep the van on the road, racked with glee at the touring Yanks who came so far to see mere rocks and paid 80 euro to do so. That being the fourth joke, the one he would think and not tell, savor in his thoughts as he waved to his neighbors with a sly wink. We made his day. And he made ours, if truth be told, about an island full of lies. There's no romance in being marooned, no great honor or special dignity, living life at the mercy of the merciless sea. The truth, not on his tongue, was in his eyes, the prophet in what fools prize. Uh, I, I should have known not to get in the car with uh, with uh, Tomas. After I did, after we, we had agreed and we were getting in, one of the other drivers said, you're going with him, are you? <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is probably a bad idea. He spent most of the afternoon in the pub, by the way. He dropped us off and went to the pub and then came and picked us up. Uh, another beautiful thing on this island uh, is this, what, what you see on your screen here is a, a beautiful cliff. Uh, there's so many of these in Ireland, and this one is called Dung Angus, which is supposedly where the castle of Angus once existed, and you can see that there's there are ruins there, uh, and it is an enormous drop. This, the photo does not do, um, it doesn't do justice to how uh, extreme the faces of the cliffs are and how high up you are, and as you'll notice, there, there are no barriers to keep you from falling off the end of the cliff, um, so it, you feel very fragile uh, and vulnerable when you're standing at the top of Dun Angus. Uh, so this little poem is about um, the very different um, attitudes my, my companion, my husband and I had about being at this great height. It's called Dun Angus. You prefer the edge, I the hold. That day at Dun Angus on cliffs above the boulder smashing sea, you set your boot in crack and craw. Leaning out beyond the ending of the ground, I love to feel beneath my feet. Great granite towers seem to sway through clouds and rain, no pick or rock to keep you from the 300 free foot free fall. Nowhere near the edge, I lost my grip. Words I flung, the wind hurled back while you clicked and held the world I couldn't look upon. At last, I turned away stepped east to tame my giddy pulse and set my feet towards the imaginary keep. Now you love to show the photographs of that fierce place claimed and unsubdued. Some of me appears in a picture, my back set against the iron sky, my wild heart a match for the sea. Um, and I will finish with just one last poem from this section. Um, I'll finish this section with one last poem, very short one. Uh, and it's called On Leaving Ire. Because whenever I leave Ireland, I feel as though I'm leaving a place that could be my home. She is all blue, air and earth, sea and sky. She is bog, the color of ruin. She is a long song across the water. I don't belong. I could make myself a life there. Um, the, the, another section of the book and another kind of travel, another kind of holy places is the place where I come from. Um, and this section of the book is called Ancestral Lands. Uh, and um, I grew up, by the way, in northeastern Pennsylvania, not a very lovely part of the world, but the part of the world that my Sicilian and um, Roman ancestors settled in, uh, mostly so that they could work, especially on my father's side of the family, they could work in the mines. Um, and so there's a series of poems that uh, honor this place, even though it's a place that is very unlovely and a place I haven't lived since I was 18 years old. 
but a place that in some ways has made me who I am and occupies a special place in my heart uh, and in my memory. Uh, and the first uh, poem in the group is called Immigrant Song. Uh, and it's a song actually to this place, um, dedicated to this place. And it's called Pittston, Pittston, Pennsylvania is the name of the town. There you go, wearing your dirty heart on your sleeve again. You are mining men and breaker boys faces smudged with coal, lunched buckets open, sandwiches sooty with the prints of their blackened hands, telling the story of their sorry days, years spent in darkness while the sun tried to shine through thick clouds that part only rarely. So unlike bright Sicily, its sapphire seeds, seas and fields of gold, Etna's rich volcanic sands, fishing boats skirting the vivid land, rife with life and color, all you lack. How much they would give and give and give to go back. Uh, another place um, that um, we all occupy, space that we have all experienced, is the space of childhood. Um, and so another one of the poems in this group is about a particular memory of a particular place that we used to go when I was a child. Um, it's called a park called Hickory Run, uh, which is in the Pocono Mountains. Uh, and this little poem remembers our, kind, our 4th of July ritual when we would go for a picnic every year called The Land of Childhood, Hickory Run, the Pocono Mountains. We would rise early to pack the picnic, dump the ice in the red metal cooler, stack the bowls of cold food our mom had fixed, potato salad, coleslaw, fried chicken, pull the baked ziti hot from the oven, bag sweet sausages wrapped in butcher paper from Sparaz's store. We were Italians and loved July 4th like Americans. The Pontiac loaded with lunch and children, my father would drive the back country roads to the distant mountains, the spring fed lake where we'd swim all day till our arms and legs ached, till our lips turned blue from the biting cold. The day would never end, we would never be old. Um, another poem in this suite is a sort of a, a poem of homage honoring the house that I grew up in, which was 304 Washington Street, West Wyoming, Pennsylvania. Um, and our family had a tragedy happen to us as children. My father died at a very young age, unexpectedly of 42, leaving behind my mother, a young widow with five children. Um, I was eight years old at the time. My youngest brother was five. Um, so uh, we were different than all the other people on our street, most of whom had, all of whom had two parent families. Um, and uh, this kind of set us apart and made us feel unwelcome in our neighborhood. Um, and I will just warn that there's a slight, pro slightly profane word in this poem, but it's necessary. Um, it's called 304 Washington Street, West Wyoming, Pennsylvania. Squat and square, her pea green shingles made her strange on our straight street. Lined by wood white houses, their faces bland and neat. We'd raise the window sashes, we'd open the screen doors. We'd stage our family drama. They always wanted more. The neighbors who disdained us, who knew we didn't fit inside their wood white world, who didn't give a shit when one of us was dying, when all of us grew poor, absorbed in their not watching. We don't live there anymore. Another place that we occupy, of course, is the place that we occupy in our families. Um, our families determine in many ways who we are. They define where it is that we belong. Um, and as the fourth child of five, uh, I was lucky to have older siblings. Um, and there was a little bit of an age difference between us. There's six and eight and nine years. So, you know, they were older than I was when I was just very small. Um, and so this little poem sonnet um, honors my older siblings. 
praise song for my older siblings and it's dedicated uh, for, to Gregory, Roseanne and Charlene. The way you struck out ahead of us and swam through rough waters with confidence that we could barely muster. The luster of our loves and deeds shone never so bright as yours. You were all drama, your reds redder, your blues deep as any sky or wine dark sea. Beside you, we felt small and paltry, unable to catch up, a lifetime of falling further and further behind. Yet you were always kind, tossed us lifelines, though you'd had none. To you, we'd be forever young, the lucky daughter, the beloved son. And, uh, and speaking of the beloved son, um, I inevitably this book, which is about holy spaces, uh, are going to, is going to have elegies for those who are lost to us. Um, and um, one of the, the, the little fellow in the front <laughs> was our youngest brother, Louis, uh, and he um, unfortunately uh, passed away last September unexpectedly. Um, Losing a sibling, we all found, is a very different experience from losing anybody else because we had always been together. We thought of ourselves as five, uh, like the fingers on a hand, and losing one of those fingers is, of course, devastating. Um, and so we're still obviously experiencing the aftermath and trying to figure out how to be in the world without one of us. Um, and this picture is a family photo, obviously. I'm the little kid in the pool who doesn't look so happy about her new brother. <laughs> and then, of course, this is my our baby brother, who was, as you can tell from the picture, our pride and joy. Uh, so this is this poem is dedicated to him. And I wrote the poem um, after an illness that he had had uh, and before uh, before he passed away. It's called The Land of Resilience. And it, it's set in Knoxville Medical Center, where my brother was in the hospital. And it's for Lou. My brother is in the hospital again. Struck by a stroke three days ago, he slowly recovers his speech, his mind, the flex of his arms and legs. He can sip from a straw and swallow like a champ. He doesn't know what day it is, but he knows how to beat like a heart, how to flow blood through his narrowed veins. The same body that ran fast, absorbed the shock of blocks on a football field and didn't stop running does what it was made to do. Time doesn't change who we are. He's still the man who life has hammered, who meets his rough end in a wrecked car, in a brawling bar, and gets back up again. Keeping an eye on the time here, I don't want to go too long. Um, so I think I will move on to a last set of poems that, um, Oh, here we are. Last set of poems that uh, are a kind of a different, uh, a, a different key, a different note as sounded at the end of the book. Um, some of you might recall back in 2018, in 2019 in the spring, uh, we were in the midst of a border crisis. And there were so many people coming across the border and they were being housed and put in cages. They were being, um, uh, so many people that were, were sick and ill parents were being separated from children. I mean, it was just a disaster. And every day on the news, there were more images and more lines and more stories uh, about uh, the sadness of the, of the situation. Um, there's nothing we can do about this when we see this kind of humanitarian crisis unfolding. But one thing we can do is bear witness to it. Um, and the ways in which poets bear witness, of course, is, is by writing poems. So I set about writing a poem a day uh, and usually the, the poem would come from a line that I had read in a newspaper or that I had heard spoken by one of the um, people crossing the border, uh, one of the immigrants. Um, so uh, there are 15 of these poems and I'll just read a couple of them, but there's very short poems and they're called triolets. And the triolet is a French form in which there's, there are several repeating lines. The first line is repeated as the fourth line and the seventh line. The second line is repeated, the second line, the fifth line, and then the last line. Uh, so 
the idea of the triolet is to create a sort of a haunting incantatory effect when we hear all of this repetition repetition and it seemed to me to be a fitting form to use um, in connection with the haunting images and um, stories that we were hearing about the border um, so the first poem is called uh, is border song number one say stolen child the world from which you've come you can't go back although you know you must your father grieves, your mother is undone. Say, stolen child, the world from which you've come. You, their only daughter, you, their only son. All their dreams are now turned to dust. Say, stolen child, the world from which you've come. You can't go back, although you know you must. Order song number two, actually the origin of all of these poems in this group came from this photograph. Um, it's a beautiful photograph, as you can see um, from the New Yorker title, A Janitor Preserves the Seized Belongings of Migrants. Uh, and one of the things that was very striking to me is, you know, they, they took basically everything that was in people's possessions, even though they had very, very few possessions. Um, but one of the things they took was their rosaries. Uh, and I was um, really pained by this idea. People travel, I travel with my mother's rosary all the time. It is, a, uh, it is like a talisman for me. It, it helps me to feel safe. Uh, and to be have that taken away from you when you're in a new country and you have no idea what's going to happen to you uh, seemed to me to be especially unkind. Um, so this was really the first of the border songs, um, border song number two. They confiscate your rosary when you come. I cannot go to sleep without one, thumbing each bead until the night is done. They confiscate your rosary when you come. There's nowhere to hide it, nowhere to run. It was my dead mother's, now I have none. They confiscate your rosary when you come. I cannot go to sleep without one. Border song number four. My child sleeps in a cage and yet he sings like the birds of paradise we left behind. Knowing nothing of the fear the future brings, my child sleeps in a cage and yet he sings. The children in the States live like kings. The lies they told us haunt my waking mind. My child sleeps in a cage and yet he sings like the birds of paradise we left behind. Border song number six. 76 women locked inside a cell made for 12. This is a little hell. We cannot bathe, we cannot stand our smell. 76 women locked inside the cell. Some of us are sick, none of us is well. 76 women dying in a cell made for 12. Welcome to our hell. I'll skip ahead to border song number 13. This image, by the way, is an image of one of the interior rooms of uh, Trump Tower in New York City. Our country has a border crisis. Our president eats cake and tweets. It's much less fun than fighting ISIS. Our country has a border crisis. A rich man doesn't know how priceless freedom is. He eats and eats. Our country has a border crisis. Our president eats cake and tweets. And finally, the last poem. Um, some of you may remember uh, that there was a, pho a photograph published on the front page of the New York Times, which was devastating of a father and his baby daughter who drowned in the Rio Grande. Uh, that father's name is Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez. Uh, he is pictured here. He's 25 years old. Uh, and his little daughter, Valeria, uh, was age two when they died. Um, I can't use the photograph of them um, in the Rio Grande because it's just too devastating to look at. Um, this obviously is a much happier time in their lives than I thought this would be a way to give tribute to this father and daughter.
Face down in the river lies a father. Beside him lies his little daughter. The saddest death is death by water. He held her when the current caught her. He did not leave, he did not falter. Face down in the river lies a father, his arms around his little daughter. Holy Land is a book of poems about one person's journey, um, but it's in a sense of a journey that all of us share. Um, we make journeys together side by side to these various places. Um, and so I thought it might be fitting just to end with one last poem, which is actually the first poem in a book called The Journey. We were warned about the weather, but we made the journey anyway. We hoped for something better than the lost lives others led. We were in love and we were wed to the future, brighter days than any we'd seen in our bleak town. Call it hope. Each new place we found was rich in what our old world lacked. We heard new music we learned to play. Once you leave, you can't go back to the dead city blues you'd known as a child. We braved wild wind, hard rain, and when the weather was bad, we sang. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Angela. We do have, um, well, one comment and one question that I, I love to read for you. Marjorie Maddox, who's also a paraclete poet, writes, ah, so grateful to have immigrant song forthcoming in our anthology, Keystone, Contemporary Poets on Pennsylvania from PSU Press in 2025. So that's something to look forward to. Yes, I was so grateful that they took that poem because it has a special place in my heart. So thank you, Marjorie, for, for taking that poem. John Paul McKinney says, hi, Angela, did you write these beautiful poems at the point you were visiting these spots or later? from notes you made while there, or later from memory. They're wonderful. I'm feeling as though I'm there. Thank you, John Paul. You're always such a generous reader. I so appreciate that. And it's a really interesting question. Usually my practice would be to write after the experience, but these poems were coming to me even as I was in the process there. So. So the morning I went out for my run, the very first poem was the, the one by the Sea of Galilee. And um, but by the time I got back to my room, I had already written the first five or six lines. Um, and and I, so I had to get a hold of a pen and paper before I forgot. And then the other interesting thing that happened is because we were on the move all the time, I didn't always have pen and paper. So I did something I never do. And I started writing poems on my phone. Um, because I knew that I would forget as these lines were coming to me. So I was literally emailing myself lines and, and beginnings of poems that I knew that I needed to remember. Um, and so that actually, I'm, I'm grateful for that because now I can use my phone anytime I want <laughs> when I have an idea for a poem. I don't have to wait till I get back to my notebook. Um, but yes, it, it was very freeing in many ways. Um, and also I was just struck by the, the immediacy of the place seemed to demand an immediate response from me. Um, and I, I just didn't want to take the time to ponder it. I, I, it's almost as though writing the poem was helping me to experience more fully and articulate more fully what I was experiencing right there. Thank you so much. Our friend Lois Romadili was here and she says, brava, beautiful poems, beautiful reading. Thank you very much, Lois. I, was, I appreciate that coming from you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, we're quickly drawing toward the end of our prescribed hour together, <laughs> sorry to say. But I'll just take a moment again to hold up this beautiful book. Angela is always very involved in the covers of her books and picks the most beautiful artwork. So. This, this collection is stunning. And it, we happen to have this fall, this collection all together, Amy's book, like we've talked about, Amy, who's here today. And then also this beautiful anthology that we have, which also features some of Angela's work. So all of us are poetry lovers and, and I encourage us to take a good look at these. Um, I know that we've had a little frustration with Amazon with getting Holy Land, Angela. So we're getting that straightened out. But in the meantime, I invite you to visit your own uh, favorite bookstore and you can always come to paracletepress.com um, 
we, we celebrate the release of this book with a special coupon code, which is holy, holy land 15 with an exclamation point. And so you'll get a, a special sale on holy land, but on um, Angela's other books with Paraclete too. So we hope you'll take advantage of that. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a long time since we've had an online poetry reading with Paraclete. We need to do more of it. So keep an eye out because, because we're gonna rekindle the tradition starting with you. So thank you so much, Angela. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. And thanks for all, to all of you who took time out of your busy days to listen. It's been a joy to be with you for an hour. Thank you so much. Have a blessed weekend, everyone. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you, I guess. Ciao, everyone. Ciao, ciao.